we'll wait a few minutes after that. Okay. Good. Uh, why do we do it? Don't do it any better. Okay. This part is my job. All right. Good. Okay. All right. Okay, it's it's uh, nine o'clock. Uh, everybody uh, who's tuning into uh, Grand Rounds, um, uh, we're going to wait a few more minutes uh, just to see the uh, uh, make sure that we, we, we you know the attendance uh, increases a bit. But then uh, from there we'll uh, we'll get started. So just bear with for a few more minutes uh, while uh, uh, while people are shuffling in virtually, uh, and then then we'll begin. Uh, but thank you for joining in a, a Grand Rounds so far. How do you like this? Best laid plans of mice and men. Um, all right, we've got about 15 attendees. We'll wait a few more minutes. It's just, just a minute after the hour. And maybe just one, maybe just one more minute, and then we'll we'll get started. So good to see you. Looking forward to your talk. Good to see you. Good to see you. It's been a long time. Yeah, I've blocked my view of you guys, but listening your voice was reassuring. <laughs> Okay, we've um, got a good number of people, and I'm, I'm sure uh, some others will uh, will kind of trickle in uh, as we get started. Um, uh, good morning, and uh, welcome everybody uh, uh, to uh, today's grand rounds. Uh, it's a very special uh, grand rounds. It's dedicated to the memory of uh, one of our own neurology residents, uh, Michael uh, Ty. Uh, this, the MTT lecture, as it's been known, is inspired by Michael's deep commitment to spiritual growth and artistic gifts, particularly his music. It's my privilege to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Shah Koshman, uh, who will offer his reflection uh, upon the field of neuroaesthetics. Dr. Koshman is an associate professor of neurology here at Harvard Medical School and a physician of the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Following graduation from the Johns Hopkins Medical School, he matriculated to Boston for internship at Children's Hospital Medical Center before entering residency in the Longwood Area Neurological Training Program. Uh, Dr. Koshman was educated by really a, a pantheon of neurological worthies. Uh, he served as chief resident under Charles Barlow at BCH, uh, Norman Geshwin at the BI, and, uh, and Richard Tyler uh, at the Brigham. He then went on to clinical neurophysiology fellowship to learn from such greats as uh, Dr. Lombroso uh, and Mark Halleth. Uh, his uh, research interests remain in clinical neurophysiology and epilepsy, particularly the neurophysiology of behavior. Um, as he spent most of his undergraduate years studying fine arts at the American University of Beirut uh, and uh, La Col de Beaux Arts in Paris, uh, he also has an especial interest in the neurological problems of visual artists. Along with Dr. Joel Katz, uh, Dr. Koshman developed Harvard Medical School's fantastic course, uh, Training the Eye, 
uh, which teaches clinical diagnosis to medical students using principles of the visual arts. and actually takes students out of the hospital uh, and into the surrounding museums, such as the Museum of Fine Arts here in Boston, the, the Gardner uh, and the Harvard Art Museums. So uh, without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, the 2022 MTT Grand Round speaker, uh, Dr. Koshman. And, and with that, I'm going to mute myself um, and, and, and give it over to Dr. Koshman. Uh, please put your questions uh, in the chat. Uh, or the question and answer section. And then towards the end of the, uh, the talk, I will help moderate and, and we'll, we'll have a few uh, uh, questions uh, hopefully answered by Dr. Koshman. Uh, and with that, I turn it. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's an honor for me to uh, give this um, Michael Ties Memorial uh, Lecture. I knew Michael when he was a resident and then we were hoping and expecting that he would join us in the uh, neuro neurophysiology fellowship here at the Brigham. We both had graduated from the same school and had interest in humanities. Uh, the subject today, which is neuroaesthetics, is a new field in uh, neurology, essentially, uh, owns its um, coining of the term. Um, to Samir Zeki, who um, is a professor at the University College in London, who in his uh, writings in 1999, he coined the term neuroaesthetics. It's also <clears throat> a good thing to remember that aesthetics in Greek means perception. So uh, although later changed its concept into the study of beauty, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the idea that he proposed is that there should be a scientific study of the neural basis of creation of art by artists. Um, this is Samir Zeki, and he's still pretty active uh, with a lot of writings in this field. His book, The Inner Vision, is something that for anyone who is um, interested in the field is a must to read. However, uh, way before 1999, um, philosophers had shown interest in the study of quote unquote beauty. This was a favorite quote by Dr. Tosteson of Aristotle saying, medicine begins in philosophy and philosophy ends in medicine. I used to uh, tell our students that there is a difference between, difference between neurologists and philosophers in that philosophers look at their own brain, we look at other people's brain. Uh, otherwise we are both studying the same basic principle. This is the uh, Aristotelian division of uh, branches of philosophy. And as we see that in education of a physician, definitely in education of neurologists, all five branches come in even at our time. Uh, although as biologists, we should reject metaphysics, but uh, for the sake of our patients in medicine, who uh, a lot of them believe in uh, supernatural power, it's important to know the principles of metaphysics. Obviously, as um, neuroscientists, we spend our life on principles of epistemology. The issue comes with the three other branches, ethics, politics, and aesthetics. With politics, although scientists used to uh, distance themselves from it, in medicine and in uh, neurology, we now are facing politically correct language, which has become a major issue, as it should be. However, philosophers had combined ethics and aesthetics uh, into one um, branch. Uh, this is sort of simple way of looking at these five branches, but for ethics and uh, politics and art, uh, the important thing is, as opposed to say logic, which is the basis for epistemology and religion, which would be the basis for metaphysics, uh, all these three deal with values. And the question of value with regard to the nervous system has been one that has interested uh, all behaviorists for a long time. In philosophy, uh, the branch now 
considered as axiology is the branch of philosophy that uh, considers study of values. And these values are divided uh, mainly in ethics and aesthetics. Now, there's no question about uh, the relationship of ethics to our daily practice. And people have spent a lot of time in uh, doing even neuroethics as opposed to ethics in medicine. However, neuroaesthetics, as I mentioned above, is a relatively new one. And there are only few people who are doing actual research on it, in, including Samir Zeki in England and uh, Dr. Chatterjee here in the States and also folks in California. Um, when we look at values, uh, Plato summarized them very easily. Truth, which was obvious, but then it was goodness and beauty, goodness for ethics and beauty for aesthetics. What he meant is that in ethics you had good and bad and in aesthetics you had beautiful and ugly. The concept of beauty has been very difficult to discuss both in philosophy as well as in sciences. And, and the term has changed uh, considerably, um, not to mention that by 1917 when Duchamp uh, introduced his famous fountain uh, to art the world and literally started and developed the Dada uh, system, uh, signed uh, as you can see as I of 1917, he changed the concept of beauty. Uh, Duchamp died of heart attack. I always used to say, if he wanted to communicate with us, he should have had an EKG machine instead of this. Uh, his bladder apparently was functioning okay. Now, when people go to define art, uh, there's multiple, multiple things written in philosoph philosophical writing. The one that I personally prefer the most is Tolstoy's book on uh, defining art. And this is sort of summarized from his ideas in that book. It's uh, supposed to be first and foremost human activity. If you find a piece of um, driftwood and uh, find it to be very attractive looking, that's not art. However, if you pick it up and modify it, put it in a frame, then it becomes art because then that's a human activity. Uh, it's supposed to be the result of creative and imaginative faculties of, of nervous system. Uh, however, it also requires a uh, skill. Uh, you can't just pick up a brush and suddenly become an artist. You have to have the skill and training. Uh, and then, of course, it has to give beauty. And that what Tolstoy mentioned, it has to have emotional power, not gold is not beauty. And with the idea of emotional power came that you can have conceptual ideas in art. And that's what uh, design is. Now, forever and ever, there has been a gap between us, say, in the world of sciences and the humanities, which still exist. But a very nice reminder was this famous lecture given by C.P. Snow, a physical chemist who also was a writer and an artist himself in his book, The Two Cultures, with, uh, although the lecture was given, <laughs> obviously, some 60 years ago, it's still very true. The one statement that he's made in his book, which I particularly like, is when he describes his reaction, says, I've been present at gatherings of people who by standards of traditional culture are thought highly educated and who have with considerable gusto been expressing their incredulity at the illiteracy of scientists. And then he goes on to say, I've been provoked and I've asked the company how many of them could describe the second law of thermodynamics? The response was cold. Yet I was asking something which was a scientific equivalent of have you read the work of Shakespeare? Now I now believe that if I had asked an even simpler question, such as what do you mean by mass or acceleration, which is a scientific equivalent of saying, can you read? The answer would be yes, cold. Uh, however, it's nice to know that the patron saint of medicine and art is the same person. Here we see a painting by van der Weyden in the early 15th century. This painting 
happens to be at the Museum of Fine Arts in the European collection. And I recommend as the museum is opening up for all of us as a measure of respect to our patron saint to go visit it. It has a very interesting also uh, art medicine landmark. If you look at the baby, this is uh, supposed to be that Saint Luke drew uh, the Virgin feeding the baby Jesus. If you look at the baby Jesus, you notice that the, uh, the, di the diagram is completely unusual. It's not what you expect of measurements of a baby as they had very poor understanding of anatomy at that early stage. This is before the burst of Renaissance. Van der Weyden's work, beautiful as it is, it's anatomically quite incorrect. Uh, later painters have tried to fix that. Although for instance, in this painting, you notice that the angel is extremely tall while uh, St. Luke doesn't look that tall, but the anatomy of the baby is still in transition. We started really looking at good uh, correlation with uh, Michelangelo in this famous uh, creation of Adam in Sistine Chapel, which what you see right now is the new cleaned up version. I actually like the old, not so cleaned up version better. Um, and uh, it seems that Michelangelo not only had an excellent idea about the human figure and anatomy, uh, but also uh, he had some neuroanatomy also. And uh, a clever guy figured out the outlines of God happens to be familiar to all of us. And that would be uh, his knowledge. However, the person who really should be considered as the father of uh, anatomy is Leonardo. So around the same time as with uh, Michelangelo, he started essentially probably the first atlas. Now, when it came to nervous system study, as you can see on the right of the screen, he uh, still believed in the cell theory of, um, of Hippocrates uh, added to that also the uh, theories of, of Galen, uh, as you can see. And when we look at his uh, diagram of the, uh, the skull, you notice that the brain is a shrunken piece of tissue up there and not considered that important because they hadn't quite made the connection there. His atlas, however, when it comes to the beauty of the um, musculoskeletal system is incredible incredible and and it's worth uh, all of us who were interested in physiology of the peripheral nervous system to look at it again now <clears throat> this actually is a picture i took um, of the copy of um, the fabrica uh, uh, our previous uh, chairman here dr tyler unfortunately uh, he then later gave it to uh, his uh, alma mater, and it's not in Boston anymore. Uh, this was the second edition of Vesalius, and we all consider Vesalius as our uh, so-called father of anatomy. Particularly, uh, this is a, a, a later painting showing him uh, dissecting the, the thorax. But he also, with the help of an artist, and this is probably the first collaboration between a physician, anatomist, and an artist, and the man was Calcar. Calcar had studied with Titian, and he was an exquisite artist, as when we see the diagrams uh, in uh, Vesalius's atlas. But particularly, as you see here, uh, the anatomy of the brain and uh, is exquisite. I mean, uh, the outlines of the basal ganglia, the thalamus, the cerebellum, the vasculature is as good as any MRI scan you can get these days. Now, this obviously meant that Vesalius had managed to cut the brain after it was fixed. Dr. Tyler used to tell us that the way he fixed the brain is he accidentally dropped the gelatinous material that they had a hard time looking at in a bucket of wine and then it got fixed and then he was able to uh, get all the structures. Now we jump to the 19th century for associating the brain with behavior really. And as you can see here, this was a, a phrenology head 
uh, as opposed to some of the ones that are commercially available these days. This one uh, shows us numbers on, uh, on the head. Um, Franz Gall, who was the founder of uh, phrenology, uh, really gave us the ability to make uh, anatomical behavioral correlation. Uh, this is the brain of uh, Tan, a uh, famous patient of Broca, uh, who noticed, obviously the brain is at the Bicetre now in Paris, um, noticed the area of encephalomalacia in the uh, uh, inferior frontal gyrus. And uh, there he made the association uh, between that area and language. Uh, uh, what Franz Gall had done is that as a good scientist, I suppose, never figured out the qualities, but if you look very carefully at the um, uh, skull, you see that phrenologists placed language uh, right on, on the lateral aspect of the orbit, which if you just put a probe in would right go to the Broca's area. The person who is sort of responsible for putting uh, qualities and, and function to the different areas that Gall had described was his student Spursheim, which has a connection with uh, the Harvard Medical School and uh, at Boston. He uh, came to Boston and uh, became very famous almost instantaneously. And he died here. His grave is in the Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. Uh, his skull happens to be at the Conway Library uh, at the Warren Museum, and this is it. You notice that he had quite a large frontal lobe. Um, what Spursheim did, also his uh, portrait is here. What Spursheim did is to start placing qualities such as what he discovered uh, with phrenology in uh, that. And it's of interest that you can see the language is placed uh, down there by the eye and the uh, area which we would probably refer to as orbital frontal uh, area is perceptiveness. Now, um, obviously this is pseudoscience. Um, however, as I said, it gave us, because Broca had good knowledge of phrenology, it gave him the ability to look at the brain of Tan and make the first clinic pathologic association regarding cortical function. Uh, Throughout history also, not only physicians had collaborated with artists in producing atlases, which after uh, Vesalius, there are a number of them, including Albinius and other great uh, anatomists and artists, uh, but there were physicians who were artists and uh, their work became important. In the 19th century, during the Napoleonic War, Sir Charles Bell of the Bell's Palsy uh, actually went to the war. Uh, he was in Waterloo and he was a very good artist and he made drawings and uh, paintings of, uh, of soldiers with lesions, in this case, showing the wrist drop of the radial nerve uh, palsy, uh, optostatonic posturing, and also a, a dissection of the of the brain. These are all paintings by Charles Bell, some of which is now in the States at the NIH library. Um, the major applicable stuff came out of uh, Saint-Petrier in Paris. Uh, this is Duchenne de Boulogne, uh, who had become a physiologist using uh, electricity. He was stimulating muscles. In this case, he was studying the uh, facial muscles uh, to study uh, human um, facial expression, uh, probably influenced a lot by the Darwinian uh, influence on studying um, uh, emotional behavior. And, uh, and then uh, when Charcot took over, uh, he uh, was very interested in art himself and uh, especially hired physicians who could either participate in the photographic laboratory that existed in Salpetrier and take pictures of patients, but also uh, do, do drawing. Uh, this is actually a sketch by Brissot, one of his students, uh, was published in Mej uh, Atlas of Charcot dissecting a brain. Um, however, the most uh, beautiful drawings that came out of Salpetrier, uh, these are a bunch of the 
uh, Parkinsonian patients at, at dinner um, and uh, came by one of his students who also happened to be a professor of art at the Col de Bazaar uh, in this uh, famous painting um, that is called the clinical lesson at Salpetrier, uh, where we see a lot of famous uh, neurologists, including the guy with the apron in front is Tourette, the guy who's holding the patient is Babinski. But the person that I was mentioning to the right of Charcot standing there uh, is Paul Richer, who was the professor at uh, it's called the Bazaar and also a neurologist trained under Charcot. Now, uh, it is quite uh, visible that his work showed up in all of Charcot's books. Uh, these are some of the works that he had uh, in the book on uh, psychiatric aspects of epilepsy. Um, and some of them are familiar, still uh, used when we are looking at patients. And uh, uh, the photographic um, uh, clinic also was producing in the style of, of Duchenne, a number of photographs of these patients again published in Charcot's work. There are uh, works also in the same book that seems to be, although not signed uh, by Richer. And, and this happens to be uh, Charcot's own drawings of uh, patients with Parkinsonism, uh, where you obviously see the stare that he was trying to portray here. Charcot also, uh, and this drawing, as we can see, was not as trained as uh, Richer. Uh, but he captured the whole idea of posture and fascinating gait in the Parkinsonians. And Richer would take Charcot's drawings, as we said, and fix them to then be uh, printed. Uh, this is one of the uh, beautiful paintings showing the stance and posture of a Parkinsonian. Now, uh, in, <laughs> in public uh, discourse, people think that uh, Freud had been a longtime resident of Charcot. He wasn't. He had a brief stint at Salpetrier, and the relationship between them, although, far, although Freud was uh, very uh, elaborate uh, by uh, Charcot, the relationship between Charcot and Freud was not as advertised in public uh, literature. But nonetheless, uh, Freud himself, first of all, was a good artist. And you can see here how uh, in his, this is the London uh, clinic, where you can see the uh, Salpetrier lesson uh, drawing uh, uh, copy is up there. And also these are some of his work. This is uh, Freud's drawings of uh, spinal neurons. And then he would draw also a pathological specimen that uh, frankly, as any illustrator would say, it's really professionally done, very beautifully done. Uh, the French also uh, had other uh, famous artist physicians. This is Chicoteau, uh, who not only has this beautiful painting, this is his sort of subject because essentially as a radiologist, he was the uh, first person who used radiation therapy in cancer. Now, close to home here in uh, Boston, uh, we have another physician artist, and that was uh, Harvey Cushing. Uh, Cushing uh, was a resident of Halstead at Hopkins. Uh, there, uh, as it was for those of us who went to Baltimore, uh, the ability to participate in what was called the Department of Art Illustration, which still exists with a number of, um, of students uh, and it has a master's degree, et cetera. He studied under the uh, artist who was uh, very influential in setting that uh, art illustration up, which was Max Brodel. Uh, Harvey, for us, for me personally, became an interesting thing. And this is a, this is a drawing uh, watercolor when he was uh, uh, vacationing in France. It's supposed to show his view from his window at the Hotel of Rain. And you can appreciate that uh, it, it really, was pretty good. Um, he had studied uh, under Brodel, and then from there, on the recommendation of Sir William Osler, uh, came to Boston and became chairman of surgery here. Uh, 
Dr. Tyler told us uh, many years ago that actually some of his drawings exist. Although uh, Cushing, while he was chairman here, had uh, set up the sort of rule that no surgeon should operate after age 65. And the story goes that as he turned 65, uh, then he didn't like the idea that um, he should uh, retire, essentially. And he took with him all the specimen and drawings and pictures of the multiple, multiple patients he had, and uh, obviously uh, to show Harvard, went to Yale. And these are all now at the Yale Library. However, what he couldn't take and this was what Dr. Tyler told us, was he couldn't take the patient's records because those belong to the hospital. Uh, at his suggestion, we pulled out all the records from the time he had been here from storage, and we started photographing. At that time, a neurosurgical resident was rotating through our service, Gene Rossich and I, uh, photographed these, and with the help of Dr. Peter Black, who was the chairman at that time, we published these drawings. Uh, you can see that these are drawings that he made almost as soon as he got out of the OR on the patient's record about what he did. And this drawing of a, a occipital uh, decompression uh, showing the cerebellum and the cord, and this one, uh, the craniotomy, uh, showing uh, his drawing of uh, what he had done in removal of the tumor uh, and the uh, frontal lobe. He also, as I said, had uh, studied under Brodel and interested very much in making neurological diagnosis. Here we see his drawing of a patient with ulnar palsy. Uh, this is from his master, uh, Max Brodel, who had shown also another patient with uh, ulnar palsy. Um, this is Max Brodel's uh, painting, which is at Hopkins. Uh, and this is a drawing by Max Brodel inspired by um, Cushing. Now, it's interesting that Cushing, although he was Halstead's resident, his mentor was uh, Sir William Osler. And you can appreciate that the uh, drawing here is of Osler and Cushing had given the whole idea to Brodel. There is a, a interesting uh, aspect of art and Halstead that I have to mention. Uh, this famous painting by Sargent of the four doctors at um, at Hopkins, which shows Osler, uh, Welsh, and, and Kelly sitting in front, and Halstead standing in the back, uh, was done by a uh, sergeant in London. And as uh, Welsh and uh, Kelly and Osler were very nicely sitting there and letting him do his work, Halstead, who was abrasive and, and impatient, would walk out and, and uh, in the middle of his painting. So sergeant uh, managed to uh, paint um, Osler, Welsh, and Kelly with good paint. And when it came to Halstead, he used a cheap paint. What is happening over years is that Halstead's face is disappearing, as you can appreciate the beginning of it in this painting. And they're having a tremendous problem now at Hopkins trying to uh, correct this uh, interesting artist's revenge. Uh, their relationship between Brodel and, and Cushing was extremely close. Brodel used Cushing as a, a model in many ways. As you can see here, this is that famous uh, drawing of Cushing doing a brain surgery. And this is actually a photograph of Cushing while he was doing surgery here at the Brigham. Uh, this is painting by Torgal of Cushing and which uh, multiple drawings and paintings were used. This one went on a US uh, stamp. Uh, there is also very interesting drawings. This one, uh, which has the uh, Hopkins uh, stationery on it, was a drawing that, that as you can see in the bottom, uh, the model was uh, Harvey Cushing for uh, demonstrating sciatic uh, nerve uh, in, in, the, uh, in the perineum. Modern painters, physicians are also known. Rodin is an uh, Italian. Uh, uh, physician artist and this beautiful diagram of the arthritic hand. And then uh, Sir uh, uh, Roy uh, Calney, who is a British surgeon, who is a transplant surgeon here, showing a patient with Wilson's disease who had just had a, a liver transplant and then another child with liver transplant here. 
And all of us are familiar with the exquisite work of Frank Netter, which has now become the standard, almost anatomy text for many medical schools uh, because they are so beautifully done and so uh, good. And Netter was also a physician. So what's the neurological aspects of this new field of neuroaesthetics? Uh, if we go uh, to James Elkins, who is the current uh, professor of uh, arts at the Art Institute in Chicago, who also is an art critic, he says something very interesting. He says, every picture is a picture of the body and every work of visual art is a representation of the body. And uh, obviously we all start believing that. In this Jackson Pollock, you, you all know that Jackson Pollock paintings are numbered with a, instead of being titled. Uh, this one is at Met, uh, this is number 31, but there's one almost exactly like this in Boston at the MFA, uh, which is number 10. Whenever we take the students to it and they look at it, uh, they all see a bunch of bodies in there. They, some of them see a dance uh, studio with a lot of people dancing. Some of them see horses and people in a fight. But nonetheless, it's amazing how this anthropomorphic idea uh, jumps into almost any painting you look at, including sometimes uh, landscapes and still life. Now, quite clearly, uh, the modern art doesn't, of course, lend itself to anatomical um, interpretation as good as Renaissance art does. However, uh, we appreciate that looking at modern art and trying to see if we can give meaning and read the patient's, uh, the, sorry, the artist's ideas, the way we should read the patient's presentation uh, can become useful. Uh, one of our uh, faculty, uh, Dr. Livingston, um, Margaret uh, has a beautiful book on relationship of art and brain. And this diagram, she summarizes what ophthalmologists tell us about what happens to uh, vision after it reaches the occipital lobe. And uh, what to us neurophysiologists uh, is easy to think about that there are these two uh, tears, if you wish, a ventral and a dorsal, and the ventral would be our temporal leads and the dorsal would be our parasagittal leads. But they, uh, uh, these so-called higher visual areas have different functions. Uh, the ophthalmologist is made it easy for us by where brain and what brain, and the where brain happens to be for motion perception, depth perception, and spatial organization, which I'll get to in a minute. It is colorblind and it's fast, but has low acuity. The Watt system, which is for object recognition and mainly for face, and now we also know for body recognition, is uh, color selective. It's slow, but it has high acuity. Now, <clears throat> the areas that people have studied in recent years, help of imaging studies, starting with PET and then fMRI, uh, did sort of confirm what the ideas were from lesion studies before. The idea of uh, looking for prosopagnosia lesions uh, led to the understanding of the fusiform gyrus in the uh, temporal lobe, uh, that uh, the fusiform gyrus obviously responsive to uh, recognition of faces. The parahippocampal place area, uh, which obviously refers to place and uh, uh, lateral occipital complex, one of the most recent uh, findings, uh, which identifies objects. And then the extra striate uh, area, which is referred to as body area, because it looks at the biological body and the superior temporal sulcus, where it's associated with movements of biological bodies. In addition, clearly, uh, emotional aspects, uh, these again from imaging studies of look, having subjects look at visual uh, signals that indicated any of these emotions or qualities uh, and looking for where uh, the imaging study would uh, become positive. Uh, amygdala clearly becomes uh, active uh, and we know that, that forever uh, that it's been associated with fear and anxiety. 
uh, interestingly, for the reward system, which comes into how we value things, the ventral striatum, and particularly nucleus accumbens has been looked at, and these areas uh, show up. This is from the work of Chatterjee, and a lot of other people have used uh, visual uh, uh, imaging to look at these. And from the work of Zeki, particularly the orbital frontal cortex, uh, and obviously the anterior cingulate and the insula and its connection to the hypothalamus has been all looked at in this uh, ideas. Uh, <clears throat> these are the areas that have showed up on imaging uh, for uh, particularly looking at the reward system in addition to um, the nucleus accumbens is the orbital frontal area. The medial orbital frontal area is involved in uh, a pleasure uh, component. The lateral orbital frontal area is involved in satiety of looking at the so called quote unquote uh, beauty. Um, and you can see again that these are the areas people had expressed interest in, and no surprise they've seen it. Now, can we make a correlation between these areas and what artists have done? Obviously, the uh, fusiform gyrus is identification of face. And with looking at portraiture, we can appreciate what the artists had put in there and what us as viewers will pick up. Uh, the idea of the body area, uh, obviously, is what we use when we look at figure drawings and figure painting and sculpture. And obviously, the place area, uh, the artists use it more than in their depiction of landscape and for the uh, lateral septal uh, uh, area for still life, the area of the objects. Now, <clears throat> when I first uh, started trying to uh, look at these, at that time interested in looking at the work of artists with uh, uh, who were uh, had epilepsy and, and later on also with uh, artists who had other uh, issues, uh, possibly degenerative disorders, such as Parkinson's disease um, and, uh, and uh, uh, dementia, uh, is that it appeared to me that <clears throat> a whole bunch of people also recently have started looking at content of consciousness. We had neurologists always were very good about levels of consciousness, uh, but the issue of content of consciousness, because it was so subjective, was not uh, looked at that much. Bernie Bars back in the 1980s came up with a great idea, which later also was uh, added to by Dehaene and Shang uh, was that of the global neuronal workspace theory. Uh, what uh, he was looking at is the idea of networks, uh, as opposed to what when we early on were thinking about parallel processing, which made us think of almost of serial events taking place. Uh, he uh, talked about this global workspace that has different inputs into it. What was uh, very interesting to me is that he also introduced an idea of time in our response. Uh, he said, obviously, uh, the first contact with uh, uh, visual input is the perceptual system, and he called that the present. And he mentioned that almost instantaneously, uh, that perceptual system connects to the uh, memory and also emotion system, which are obviously amygdala and hippocampus being almost exactly in the same area. Uh, and he called that the past. So here comes present in the past. However, uh, as uh, Zeki Hulz had pointed out, and as uh, folks who are frontal lobe experts know very well, uh, that the orbital frontal area is where uh, these things get classified and give value. And then from there, it goes to uh, the frontal lobe uh, idea of the motor system, which he designated as future, uh, which sort of tied together the ideas of the philosophers and physicists of the idea of past, present, and future to this uh, consciousness theory. Obviously, the uh, parietal lobe uh, with a uh, uh, question of uh, uh, focusing uh, was also uh, initiated. Now, since they came up with this uh, uh, consciousness uh, theory, uh, people have come up with a lot of other and, and they, the whole field of consciousness has blossomed and uh, 
I'm pretty sure that uh, sometime within our lifetime, we will have a better understanding of contents of consciousness. So now, um, uh, Dr. Joel Katz and I, who Joel is a very good friend and mentor, uh, we both had trained at Hopkins and had taken the, the art courses. Um, I had the um, opportunity to see two of uh, Goda, uh, of Rodel's uh, students, uh, Leon Schlossberg, who was teaching master classes at the time of student, and also later, uh, uh, what he had done is he had trained a number of women artists, uh, which they referred to, to them as the women, women group, who were, became illustrators for the major textbooks. Almost any textbook anatomy do you uh, open and you admire the drawings uh, are students of Brodel. Uh, I had the opportunity to see one when Dr. Shilito was one of our neurosurgeons was uh, doing a atlas and and the artist uh, was working here at the Brigham, which we could go and see her work. So the question was, can we use art in medical education? In my case, uh, my interest was obviously art in, uh, in training our students uh, to do uh, the neurological exam. I, I like this Yogi Berra thing, you can observe a lot just by watching. Um, the interesting comments comes from Sir Conan Doyle, um, who, uh, you know, his creation of, of um, uh, uh, all of his characters were out of his own experience, uh, not Dr. Watson as much as Sherlock Holmes. And Sherlock Holmes, in um, uh, most of his stories, points out that Watson looks but does not observe. And one of the ideas that we propose is that we have to teach students how to observe and, and make conclusions and meanings out of that. Uh, there's another very famous story that uh, Holmes and Watson had gone uh, camping and in the middle of the night, Holmes wakes up Watson up and says, Watson, what do you see? And Watson looks up at the sky and says, I see the glory of God's creation, the beauty of the universe, et cetera, et cetera. And, and Holmes said, no, stupid, somebody stole our tent. Now we looked at uh, if we could see what in the definition of art will have to do with the definition of the examination and evaluation of patients. If we say that this is an expression or application of human creative skill in so many ways, we have to keep that in mind and imagination typically in a visual form. Obviously that's what both uh, Dr. Katz and I picked uh, as Michael was mentioning early in using the museums around the medical school, uh, such as painting, sculpture and uh, other works of art. Uh, again, uh, the idea of beauty, meaning that the one that causes emotional uh, response as Tolstoy would have told us. Uh, when we first started, this was our faculty. We had Dr. Livingston, who has done a lot of exquisite research in the field. We had art leaders, uh, and we had artists uh, like Jonathan Nash. And then we had physicians, a radiologist, Dr. Schaefer, a pulmonologist, Dr. Brown, and uh, Dr. Ship, an internist who was also an artist to study the uh, problems. What we were after was to teach them visual literacy. Now that according to artists is uh, essentially trying to dissect a, a picture and uh, to see if you can extract meaning from it. Uh, very much like what we do when we examine a patient to see uh, whether we can figure out the pathophysiology from visual cues. In art, uh, there is such a thing called formal analysis which is the breakdown of any work of art into line, uh, looking at proportions, shape, looking at patterns, form, looking at rhythm, texture, negative form, and also color and balance. Uh, they, beyond that, then goes this idea that the artists have developed in teaching art called visual thinking strategies, which essentially um, someone as a moderator would keep asking questions about what the observer is looking at. In this case, 
we have medical students and residents who are looking at paintings and to see if they can extract meaning out of that after they uh, done uh, their uh, formal analysis. Um, and then we take them to clinic. These are uh, then patients who have either marked findings as this gentleman and or minor findings and see if the students can apply the same principles as what they do with portraiture and looking at the body and sculpture or, or figures uh, to uh, what they see in the clinic. Um, Rudy Arnheim was a uh, uh, psychologist uh, who was professor here at uh, Harvard for a while and then uh, left, has a number of books about visual perception and visual attention, uh, which applies a lot to what we do on inspection and observation during our evaluation. As these very simple diagrams, if you look at this diagram, a circle within the square, which is almost slightly to the right, as opposed to this one where it's way to the right and implying that the tension that is uh, produced by the minor finding is sometimes even more than the tension produced by the mark findings. And again, this helps the students to um, understand and uh, uh, major uh, findings as this drawing by, God, by Brodol again uh, of Apert syndrome shows a lot to them when we take them to pediatric uh, observations. Uh, this is the setup of our course in 10 sessions. Uh, we go through the basics, uh, Dr. Livingston, and then we study line and associate that with evaluation of the face and cranial nerve evaluation, and then motion and form uh, to associate that with the body. And also, of course, pattern and texture in understanding dermatological uh, uh, findings. Uh, X-ray is also evaluated as a, as a two-dimensional taking to three-dimensional thinking. Uh, we also looked at what uh, we uh, had achieved. This was um, published by one of our students uh, who did pre and post evaluation of uh, a group of um, original medical students who had taken the course and their classmates who had not taken the course, uh, which we did a pre and post evaluation of both um, images of, uh, of uh, patients and images of uh, works of art. And <clears throat> we found a significant difference in what they managed um, the ones who had taken the course in terms of uh, picking up the visual uh, findings as opposed to the ones who hadn't. This was almost after uh, 10 weeks. And also even in some of our students in terms of this <clears throat> sessions attended and their ability to make those uh, diagnoses. Uh, the course is still going on. I always say that we enjoy it more than the students do uh, but it's also very um, helpful that we take them out of the hospital environment into the museum where there is no more pressure and also they have an easier time expressing their um, findings uh, without the fear of the hierarchy in the, in the hospital. Please said art does not reproduce what we see, it rather makes us see. And uh, this training regarding uh, 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 developing uh, skills in observation uh, clearly is something that students um, um, need to learn. Need, they need to learn visual literacy, uh, which is something that even most of our schools don't, don't do now, which they should and early on. Okay, I will be delighted to um, answer any questions. I have to admit that I found out over years that nothing makes people more emotional than when we talk about uh, art and medicine. Uh, I would not be uh, offended if you guys become emotional, so please do. Michael, are you going to be there? So, uh, yes, uh, yes. So there, there was a there was a question uh, by uh, Dr. Rosenberger. Actually, I think I I think I clicked on him so that he could talk if he wants. Um, but just in case, I will uh, repeat the question. Um, uh, Dr. Rosenberg, he writes, fascinating talk. He says, I note that one of your earlier 
uh, slides omits values uh, from the description of epistemology. Uh, he says, I am personally grateful to Norm Geshwin uh, for his insights about the early contribution of emotional salience to all perception. The question is, do you agree? Definitely, I do agree. The reason why I emphasize there is because we assume logic to be the basis for epistemology. Now, and there's no question, no question. Now, where learning is involved uh, in epistemology, so the whole thing is about how we learn uh, that, that the value of the amygdala and the emotional component to what we learn has been studied over and over, even mentioned, interestingly, by Aristotle. Um, as you know, his father was a physician, and he had he had mentioned that um, that it's important to have a heart response when you are trying to learn uh, logic, and uh, uh, even up until uh, Shakespearean term, and uh, all of you guys were more versed in Shakespeare than I am, uh, he said in um, I think Merchant of Venice, he said, "Tell me where is fancy bread, be in the heart or in the head." Uh, they believed a lot in the component of autonomic response during learning. I fully agree. And thank you for pointing that out. Thank you very much. Nothing further. Michael, are there uh, any other any, questions? If, uh, that, uh, that was the only question posted. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, just either click the hand raise kind of function um, or, uh, or put your question in the chat. Uh, we'll just give maybe one minute just to make sure. Uh, or a little less than one minute. Um, anybody else? Uh, oh, oh, I guess we do. Uh, we've got somebody from uh, Tess. Oh, Tessa. Uh, all right. Um, he, uh, I put you on, Tessa, so you can talk if you'd like. Sure, that was a uh, beautiful Hi. talk. What a pleasure to hear your voice. Yeah. And, uh, Absolutely fascinating. I mean, I've heard you talk before, but not for many, many years. And I think it was a wonderful lesson and review and general philosophical um, conversation. Thank you very much. And it's good to see you too. But... Our new audience should know that you are one of my mentors. So I, <laughs> I'm honored. Oh, you. well. Thank you. Uh, and then we do have uh, 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 Frank uh, Gren asked, uh, in a very pithy, uh, temporal lobe epilepsy, dash, hypergraphia, dash, art, question mark. Definitely, that uh, was, um, I hope we'll have a chance to, for me to tell you about what my early inter interest was. Um, uh, because of a Oedipal mistake by my father, uh, which at the time that I was leaving for college, he told me, I expect you to register as a pre-med. As soon as I got to college, I registered as a fine arts major. And, and if, just in case you thought Oedipus was disappearing, it's not. Um, and I told him that. And I, no, I'm very sorry, whatever I did, but at that time I registered as a fine art, but I wanted to be a physician. So I was taking pre-med courses, but I had to get my fine arts advisor to sign my study card. And every time the guy would look at it and say, organic chemistry. And I would say, of course, because I'm interested in colors and I would like to study uh, colors in the real form. And he would say, okay. And, and he would say physics. And I would say, of course, I like to study light. The whole impressionist thing is about light. and I want to study physics. So he didn't have much objection to biology because he figured out that's anatomy, I figured. But anyhow, I eventually um, uh, got to my senior year and when I went to ask him for advice regarding my thesis, he said, you're the one who is interested in colors. You should write your thesis on Vincent van Gogh. He has a very interesting theory of colors. I had heard about van Gogh. I knew nothing about him. And definitely, I didn't know much about colors, despite organic chemistry. So I had to go and study it. It turned out that um, what was the major uh, essentially discovery of Van Gogh was the idea of using tertiary colors. Tertiary colors, if you are, remember the color wheel, uh, the primary colors happen to be yellow, blue, and red. And then secondary colors are mixtures of that. The yellow and blue becomes green. And then 
uh, tertiary colors are the opposing on the wheel of colors, like green would be next to red. So red and green become tertiary colors. So I had studied that and <clears throat> of life of Van Gogh himself, I read these letters which are available and I decided in my head that the guy had depression. He shot himself after all, uh, suicide. And, and that I believe. When I was a second year medical student, Dr. Geshwin uh, came to Baltimore to give a talk about the frontal lobe actually. He had published an article in a New England Journal about frontal lobe and he was going to talk about that. And that was when I first heard from him about hypergraphia. And when I thought about the one that I had written my thesis on that, God, he was hypergraphic. I mean, the number of paintings he did in such a brief period of time, a number of letters he had written about his paintings in such a brief period of time, qualified him as a hypergraphic uh, in all aspects. So anyhow, I walked to Dr. Geshwin at the end of the lecture and asked, uh, he, I asked him, I said, I know about someone who was hypergraphic, but didn't have uh, what he had said at that time, that patients with temporal lobe epilepsy are hypergraphic. I said, he didn't have epilepsy. And without my saying anything more, he said, you mean Vincent Van Gogh? I said, how did you know? He said, oh, he had epilepsy. His medical records are available. And he told me who had them. It was uh, Henri Gasteau, a famous French uh, epileptologist. I so happened that, uh, that France was on my way back home for that summer. And I managed to get there and go to Marseille where Dr. Gasto was supposed to be. Unfortunately, I got there and he wasn't there. It was summer, nobody stays where they are in France. But his wife was there, Madame Gasto, who was also a neurologist. And she very graciously agreed to let me look at the medical records that was available about Van Gogh's admission to the St. Paul Mausoleum in, in near Marseille, um, uh, near Arles, essentially, which is where he had been. And there the diagnosis was clearly made not only of his epilepsy, but also the doctor who was there who apparently was trained in, in seizures because he was a Navy doctor. And he had, had seen a lot of that by saying that uh, his problems and his symptoms were more consistent with inter behavior. And one of them was the fact that they chose colors that were very different. As you look at Van Gogh's work, you see this tertiary color. Uh, combinations. So anyhow, when I was a medical student and after Dr. Geshwin raised my interest in that, I was looking for work really, just work at Hopkins. And those of you are Hopkins, Hopkins grads from my time remember that uh, there was an art studio in the Phipps Clinic, uh, the psych uh, clinic. And I thought, well, art studio is right up my alley. And I went there and I registered. And there I had the chance to watch patients paint. And a lot of these patients, obviously with sight patients, the drawings or paintings were similar to what you would expect for schizophrenics and depressed, but there was a very small group of patients with temporal epilepsy and these were using tertiary colors. So I got interested in that and later on, we uh, studied here a number of them and um, uh, Dr. Stephen Schachter at the BI has actually collected temporal lobe epilepsy patients' paintings and published them. Um, you can look those up. And then um, uh, we looked at a whole bunch of patients for a complex of symptoms, including hypergraphia uh, with um, uh, brain electrical activity mapping, which was developed by Dr. Duffy at Children's Hospital. And we were using it in looking at adults. And uh, again, uh, out of our patients, which was not that many, roughly about 20, 25, when we asked them to select paintings to paint, they selected the tertiary colors. Uh, the idea of tertiary colors and what it does and how it's presented to the brain, particularly to the temporal lobe, has been studied by uh, physiologists and neuroscientists such as Dr. Livingston, uh, and quite clearly, uh, if you spend time and ask questions from your temporal lobe epilepsy patients, you can pick up on all the uh, symptoms that in my early writings are referred to as Geshwin syndrome. 
However, having said that, <laughs> all of this that I just told you, I'm sorry for this long answer, has been attacked by a lot of people who very strongly, uh, I guess with their amygdala, feel about Van Gogh and about art and about all of that. So with that uh, uh, excuse, <laughs> with that apology uh, for both the length of this and offending them, uh, I hope I answered your question. Well, well, th thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Cushman, and uh, and thank you everybody uh, for being here uh, to listen to the uh, the Michael uh, Ty uh, Grand Rounds, uh, Dr. Cushman. This was a, a, just a fantastic uh, um, explication of the blended borders, you know, between medicine and and, and art. So we appreciate uh, you coming to talk with us today. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, and and thank you all very much for 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 coming. Thank you, Michael.